Yeah, so uh, that was uh, the, f- uh, the Four Horsemen with uh, Rockin' Is My Business, and uh, we found Mo. Uh, his classic rock and roll v rugby league culture clash. When I say Henson Park, he just assumed it was a Henson Park pub. So we're sitting in the tab at the Henson Park pub. How long were you waiting for me, Mark? I was waiting 30 minutes for you there. <laughs> right, OK. But I was at Henson Park. You, you were at Henson Park, and I was at Henson Park Hotel, <laughs> which is what I generally assume when people say, come to Henson Park. I generally mean the pub, not, <laughs> not, not to kick a footy around. Now, you're, uh, um, you, you were saved from a horrible sight, yeah. AFL. AFL posts and kids playing AFL on Henson Park. Oh, jeez. This is New South Wales, isn't it? <laughs> Last time I looked. None of that VFL nonsense over here. <laughs> it's terrible. It's the Phantom Menace. Um, now, Manly, yesterday. Give you, uh, uh, most people will be listening to it later in the week, so we'll say on Sunday we've got to be a bit sort of, uh, you know, vague in that area. But what do you think? You would have been quite happy with him. You're a Manly fan. Yeah, being a being a massive uh, Silver Tail and proud supporter, I uh, I was I was thoroughly happy with with how uh, how we went yesterday. I thought I thought defensively we were pretty strong. Attacking wise, I think as well that Brisbane didn't bring as hard as they could have. Like the support play wasn't there and stuff like that. So I think that we did real good with our um, with our four, you know four men out. Little hoppers not back yet, but we still did real good to hold it to that score. I thought we were going to get walked all over, and especially the first 30 minutes of the first half, I was crying with how they were, they were just, they were really overplaying us, and, and then sort of you know, by the second half, they come at, man, they come out strong, and that was, I think that really sort of evened things out, and they allowed to take some of the momentum from Brisbane. What about the brawl last week? What was your take on that? Were you happy with the way the league dealt with it? Or um, To be honest, I won't lie. Like, I read an article earlier in the week and it said um, most men from their lounge room chairs had a roar of approval. And uh, to be honest, I was kind of stoked to see a bit of passion for the game. Like, granted, it was ugly. Like, I'm not saying that it wasn't ugly or anything like that. But I was happy to see the two top teams go at it so hard that they wanted to blow each other. Like, I mean, to me, that was a real element of passion that I think that you you know that gets gets lost a bit in the game and it's much it's a much better look for the game for guys to be fighting on the field than it is for them to be fighting at the bourbon and beef steak on a Saturday night or yeah but what about after you got sent to the sin bin <laughs> Yeah, no, it was it it, it got pr- it got pretty nasty. I mean, the the blokes flying in from across the bench and everything like that. I mean, you know, but a lot of my mates, me and my mates are still arguing about this because like a lot of my mates are pretty cluey, but and they're also into their footy. So we've been arguing the up and downs of this whole thing, and I think that. Um, you know, as, as a mate keeps telling me it's a bad look for the game, and I think that you know a bit of argy bargy is, is not as bad a look for the game as other things that are. But, but if you'd just been across the road a second ago, you know that a lot of those parents who are dropping their kids off and picking their kids up at the AFL would have watched that last Friday, and that, they would think, "Geez, I made a, the right call here about what what sport for little Johnny to play." Yeah, you got you do have a point there. You do have a point there that um, that as far as a look for the kids go, like for your five-year-olds and stuff like that who, like I mean, look, when I was an eight-year-old kid and I was playing hooker for my school and um, you know, I used to really look up to like Jeff Tuvey especially like just as a good bloke and good player and everything like that and I always rated him as a bloke as well as a player so I think that there is, there's definitely an element that it's like it's it, it would definitely encourage parents to be more likely to make their kids play soccer than AFL but at the same time I don't think having odds on who's going to score the next try every five seconds on the telly is a good look for the kids either. Like, I think that that, to me, is a bit more damaging to the game because I think that in long term, that that heavier gambling focus... Is, like, if I was a little kid and I was eight-year-old going, who's going to score the next try, I'd be telling my old man, like, Dad, Dad, we could win a hundred bucks if I just put two bucks on on um, on twos to score the next try. Twos wouldn't have scored it, but you know, you know what I mean? And I think that's a bit more of a worry. I remember when Footy Tab first started because I'm older than you. I remember when Footy Tab first started winning a mozza on the Footy Footy Tab in like the 80s. And as a little kid, I wanted I wanted to have a bet because the, the, cause it was on during the footy and I thought it was you know harmless. And, and I, I'd actually like to see like taxpayers' money gets used so much to... I was thinking this the other day. Taxpayers' money gets used to warn you against the dangers of smoking and drinking. W- w- have they just bought everyone off, the betting in- 
industry. They've bought everyone off. Like I'd like to see my taxpayers' money spent on saying that betting is a health hazard. I, I want to see. I, I'd happily contribute to that. You know. I totally agree, mate. And I'm. And this is coming from a guy. I play poker. I like to gamble, but there's not eight-year-old children sitting at a poker table next to me mm. and looking up to me and going, wow, Joey Johns is, he's, you know, it, it's kind of like this association thing. And I do think it's bad. And I do think the gambling, um, especially the sports tab stuff is just, I think, I do think it will harm league more than it does good right now with the cash injection. I honestly think that. Yeah, yeah. Now, tell us a little bit um, about your background. You're from Newcastle. Is that right? I lived in Newcastle for three years. Um, I went, I am actually in Northern Beaches boy mm. uh, born in South Africa moved to Manly when I was like two years old lived in Manly Beacon Hill grew up like lived in Beacon Hill right behind Brookie Oval there so we used to sneak on to Brookie Oval when we were kids mm. and pretend to score tries when we were like eight nine years old used to get ripped on our tracky dacks and all that by the barbed wire but you know that's that's where I grew up but I moved to Newcastle to go to uni when I was uh, 18 and I happened to live in Newcastle when they won two premierships back to back you know not including you know the premier they stole off Manly in the mid 90s, but we won't go into that. But I lived in Newcastle when you know the Joey Johns Newcastle two premierships in a row, 2001 to 2003, kind of when Newcastle were a real strong football team. And um, that actually made me go for Manly even harder because everybody in Newcastle hates Manly so much, and being you know they'd always carry on about it. And I'd kind of wasn't following footy that much at the time. I'd kind of stopped following it for a, for a year or so or something. I can't remember. I think I went overseas or something like that, and I just wasn't following footy that much. And being back in Newcastle with everybody hating Manly, the next day I was wearing my Manly jersey to uni, and um, I was doing the Eagle Rock all over Newcastle. And what did uh, what did you? Mum and Dad, Mr. and Mrs. Mayhem, what do they think of that? <laughs> what, the, the new ca- the, which part? The Newcastle part? The Manly part? Or the doing the Eagle Rock? Tell us about the Mayhem family tree. Um, my old man, my old man, I was just telling Steve before, my old man loves Darren Lockyer. Like, which I don't understand being that, you know, we're all Manly supporters. He's, he's not so much. Dad just likes football. Dad will watch every rugby league game going on the weekend. Like, um, which is a bit strange because uh, you can't see me in radio world, but we're Indians. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, and I—I I mean, I used to play. Uh, not American Indians. No, not not no, not the not the, not the rain dance kind, the spice kind. And um, so, you know, there's yeah, the Indian family you could imagine on the side of the on the side of the footy field cheering on me playing playing football for my school was pretty 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 funny. But I used to have a um a grade in grade five. My grade five teacher uh, played second row for Manly, and he also played uh, for Australia. I mean, was that? His name was Alan Thompson. It was oh, like yeah. I think it was in the late sixties, early seventies, or thereabouts. Maybe Alan Thompson was more late seventies, early eighties. I think. Yeah. I think because so. I because I followed the Steelers as a kid, and he played against them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We had Brian Johnson, the St George fullback, as a teacher when I was in school. No kidding. Yeah. No kidding. Because I had made to had Desi Hasler as well up in Narrowena, but he. Um, he really inst- the two things he instilled in me was um, one was a love of words love of reading books and everything like that and the second one was a love of rugby league like I was a soccer player but he got me into rugby league my old man loved rugby league anyway we loved to watch it together and so that's when I started playing rugby league and so on yeah, yeah. and now tell us about the band when did you get involved in music and a lot, some people may not have heard of Hell City Glamour so give us a sort of Reader's Digest version of the <laughs> <laughs> the, the the funny thing about life is, no. Uh, uh, well, Hell City, uh, I've been playing guitar since I was, you know, young teenager. But Hell City been around since about 2003. Uh, it's a bunch of mates, really. We all kind of grew up together, skate, skated together, everything else like that. Just wanted to play really kind of, you know, loud over the top kind of brashy rock and roll which they're just at that time in Sydney there just wasn't really like I mean it's different now where you see lots of blokes walking around in super tight jeans and cowboy boots and long hair but when I joined um, Hell City you, you didn't see that a lot in Sydney you know which is kind of cool I mean we're maybe we're responsible for part of it or something I don't know but um, yeah that's that's how I joined it was just basically to want to play like loud full on rock like you know ACDC Motley yeah. Crew kind of stuff and then ever since then we put 
put out an album, put out some records and stuff like that, toured over in the States, got the record out in Europe and yeah, just keep on keeping on. <laughs> do you feel do you feel like you can't like you you'd love to go to Europe I'm sure and, and sort of tour on the back of that record label you got, but it costs a lot of money, doesn't it? It's sort of do you feel now that there's potential there but you just can't get the music to enough people? That's 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 really the hardest thing. I mean the the problem is the, the money just keeps falling out of it as well. Every time there's uh there's money to tour or agents who are ready to put the cash together and all that stuff. I mean we don't want to make money off it, we just want to get over there. Mm-hmm. But the you know, the economy falls over her or something else happens and it's just it's just one thing after the other, you know, the global financial crisis just killed money for new acts to tour and all that kind of stuff. So I mean, you know, it's it's frustrating in a way because you've got all these real diehard fans who are going out and getting your logo tattooed on them. They're like, when are you coming here? And they're not aware that, you know, you're a self managed band who've all got to have jobs and pay the rent and everything like that. It's like, well look, we'd love to come there and it's not like it's it's not on the tour schedule schedule or something. It's a case that we just don't have the cash, mate. As yeah. much as we'd love to, it's just not there. So what are your plans? You've been recording, you've got a new record coming out soon? Yeah, hopefully um, it'll either be in December or January the record should be done and out and all that. And this one's a bit of a different approach. We're kind of taking like the Rolling Stones Exile on Main Street approach in that we're, we're not doing it over just like this is the week and we're doing the album. We've we've done it over six months and we're kind of... Are you all living in the same house in France? <laughs> living in the same house in France doing doing lots and lots of bad things. No, no, I wish we were, but, um, oh, God, I wish we were. <laughs> i just tell you the bad things. So you can you all live in a separate house in France. That'd be even better. That, 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 that would be the, probably the preferable option. Being, being that I'm the only single man in the band, um, yeah, I'd probably need a house to myself because I don't know if I could put the other guys' girlfriends and wives and whatnot through my single life. <laughs> So t- the song we're about to play is called Singapore Sling. Is it inspired by a drink or a place or what? Um, actually, all our songs uh, have a meaning that's actually very specific. Mm-hmm. And not many people know that because they're all quite specific. But Singapore Sling has to do with um, letting loose. Mm-hmm. But it also has to do with Oscar breaking his arm. Because the dopey bugger, the, um, we had a bunch of, you know, we had shows to do everything else like that. So what does he decide to do? He decides to go drunk and skateboarding in cowboy boots and so he um, so I think there's a line in the song where he goes Someone's celebrating a birthday. somebody's celebrating a birthday awesome <laughs> um, I think he says yeah um, don't talk about never as you wrap another wing in another Singapore sling because he was he's had an arm in a sling but it's also to drinking reference and everything else like that cool yeah thanks mate thanks dude